Donate the Voluntarius Livestream, Episode 202. All right, what's up, everybody? It is Nate the Voluntarist, and today I have a, another great show for you. I have a returning guest. He is a patent attorney and Austrian school theorist and probably one of the best anarchist thinkers out there, and that would be Stefan Kinsella. So, Stefan, welcome back as always. Thanks very much, and I'm actually number two on the rankings right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we will Wait, see- who's first? Wait, who's Papa. first? Papa. <laughs> oh, of oh. course. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, any, anyways, uh, we will see. I, I'm if... going to put some poison in his drink when I see him in Turkey this year and claim the throne. <laughs> so, um, so uh, we will see if we can do another show without talking about IP because so far we have, we have. Uh, I've uh, been doing a show where we're basically talking about IP, but uh, I don't know. We'll we'll see, we'll see if that pops up or not. <laughs> or, 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 or bit or Bitcoin. These things always seem to come up lately. Bitcoin and IP. Oh yeah, yeah. That that's another thing. <laughs> and Megan and Megan and Prince Harry too. That too. Wow. <laughs> Depends on what circles you run in. I mean, it's weird. I never watched. I I just didn't watch the wedding. I didn't. I wasn't interested in it. But I just watched the bad lip reading version of it. <laughs> if anybody yeah. has seen that, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, um, so uh, also joining us is uh, Tom. It's his first time on, and uh, yep, F- and ethical pirate. So, Hello. all right. So, um. I think uh, a good place to start is uh, one of the uh, topics that Tom and I uh, discussed uh, during the uh, in the um, DMs on Discord. Um, so I'm uh, trying to figure out how to word it. Uh, hold on, I'm going March first. March first. March first. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let's see. It's. It says uh, libertarian strategy and what the next generation of libertarians and anarchists will be up to. Something like that. Um, Unless you have a different way of uh, wording it. You asking me? Uh, I I mean, I I was kind of asking Tom uh, how uh, how he would word Uh, it just – I don't know. I kind of forgot about that. So i guessing it means sort of like... Uh, I forget where I asked this, but it was sort of like me. Like I asked someone this, the question of like how the Austrian school has kind of like a torch thing going on. First it was um, Menger, then... Bumbawerk, then Mises, then Rothbard, and now Hoppe. And I was asking, like, who's gonna hold the torch after Hoppe? I think. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I've I've seen that that kind of question asked uh, about libertarian leadership, you know, intellectual leadership, and Austrian. As I was, you know, last 15, 20 years, everyone talks about it. Um, now, and keep in mind, there's you know there are different strands of, of Austrian thought. I mean, there's there's the, the Hayekian sort of wing and the and the Misesian wing, and then there's even others. Um, but uh, so you had like uh, Karl Menger at the beginning, right? Yeah. But then after that, I'm trying to remember and trace all the names out. So then you had like kind of the Rothbardian wing would be like Menger, Bambaverk, Mises, uh, Rothbard, Hoppe, like that, and then. A lot of the yes. other Austrians associated with the Mises Institute, like Salerno and Herbert, Jeffrey Herberner, um, Guido Hulsman, um, Bob Murphy to a degree, um, well, actually completely, 
And then on the other side, I think then you had like uh, uh, Weezer, Weezer early on, and 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 then Hayek, and and you know people like even like Lachman to a degree. Um, and the Hayekians sort of focus more on this dispersed knowledge, price signals going through the economy type thing, and the Mizizians focus more on praxeology, like analyzing act, analyzing human action hmm. uh, in a catalectic or a market economy framework. That's you, you you make some assumptions about you know we have money and we have trade, um, um, you, analyzing it kind of deductively using the means and the framework of praxeology. Um, and then so Rothbard adds kind of his radical politics onto that, and Hoppe builds on both Mises and Rothbard and all this. Um, there are a bunch of young, really sharp Austrian thinkers. There's Dito Hulsman, who's – well, he's my age, 54-ish, so not that young anymore. Uh, Philip Bagus. So there there are several um, who I think are – and Bob Murphy, you know, the younger ones. Um, it seems to me that system builders are getting far fewer and far between. You know, like Rothbard was a like say Ayn Rand, who Rothbard sort of was influenced by, was a big system builder, and Rothbard was a big system builder. Hoppe has also a broad vision, um, like his views encompass not just economics, uh, but also also libertarian theory, but uh, and also some cultural conservative stuff and some history stuff. But I don't think his his view is a comprehensive view of the world. Um, as much as Rothbard's tried to be, and as, certainly as much as Rand's tried to be. So the new generation is more. I mean, I always thought like uh, like my, my Guido and I are best really good friends. We've always been good friends. We we met together around 1994 or five on a, no 95 on a bus from Atlanta Airport to Auburn where we were going to meet Hans. I had met Hans once before, and he was going to meet him for the first time to study under him for his PhD dissertation in economics. And uh, so in a sense, like I sort of absorbed a lot of my libertarianism from Hans, and Guido absorbed a lot of his uh, economics from Hans. Uh, and although I'm Austrian too and Guido's libertarian too, it's sort of like we're like – you had to split Hans in two to get the two of us. Do you know what I mean? Like. I'm not like Hans on economics, and Guido isn't like Hans on libertarianism, right? Um, so you have more specialization now. You have, uh, I think you're going to have to pick and choose and find people that are specialists to, to know it all. Like some, uh, Tom Woods is good on history, you know. Um, Bob uh, Murphy's good. Need, on, I uh, need to go right now. Oh, you need to go. Yes. Oh, okay. We lost Tom. I I, I think so. Yeah, we did. Okay. Um, if you want to finish what you're saying, that's fine. Well, so who's going to carry the torch? I don't know. I mean, there's always – I don't despair. I think there's always younger people rising through the ranks. I'm always impressed by the people that I see. Um, who I could name as like the new Hoppe? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't. I can't. No one comes to mind. I think lots of people have different aspects of that. Of that. Of the kind of, and partly it's because Mises and Rothbard and then Hoppus almost have almost they completed it, but they've honed it to such a great level that you know, in a way, there's less and less improvement to do or work to be built upon. I mean, you can always find new things, but we're to a more sophisticated level than than what Rothbard inherited. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, I, I... Uh, I would like to say, apologize if I'm not really talking that much because I kind of stayed up all night trying to type my agorist script. Ah, <laughs> my video. Who's that? Is that ethical pirate talking? Yes. Yeah, I, I, it's me. okay. Yeah, your your screen's not glowing, so I could I would wanted to be sure. Weird glitch, I guess, but. Yeah, they're they're like you said. There, there's tons of people that could take Hoppa, Hoppa's place and stuff. Uh, I see like a lot of like people my age actually, uh, you know, doing uh, doing things like writing articles and posting as many uh, free thoughts as they can, uh, which is pretty cool, and it shows that we're not lazy. <laughs> Yeah, and I think you know Mises and Rothbard and Hoppe have spawned you know generations and dozens, if not hundreds, of very smart um, 
people who've learned from them. So their ideas will survive because of their books and their their write, you know, their their, their talks. Um, and people will keep promoting that and then building on it and applying it to current events. So, you know, I see no crisis. <laughs> I think it's it's good that they their ideas have spread so much and they have so many followers and fans and devote devotees. It's it's kind of like with uh, Sam Conkin, you know, Victor Komen just uh, started a GoFundMe to uh, um, get his get Sam Conkin's works uh, archived yep. online. Yeah, he did. Uh, I actually, yeah, I, I donated to that, and uh, same maybe here. We should promote. Maybe we should promote it because it was a, it was a, it's a it's a worthwhile cause. Uh, um, if you have the website, he sent me an email today. Actually, um, yeah, Konkin, For people who don't know, was like an early kind of underappreciated agorist or agorist. I think they they pronounce it. Um, Sam Konkin said- Sam Konkin would have said agorist. That's what I always said, agorist in my mind. But I heard um, on the video that uh, on the GoFundMe page that um, that uh, Komen did, uh, he called he he said agorist. So maybe that's because it was called the agora, the open marketplace. Um, I mean, agorist is an way, easier way of saying it. Yeah. By the way, Komen himself, um, I read I think three of his novels in, in, back in the day. They were they were great. Uh, Solomon's Knife and uh, the Jehovah yeah. Contract are the two I remember. Oh, actually, that's the two I read. I, I don't think I ever read the Kings of the High Frontier, but I did like those two a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I just I just ordered my copy of uh, the New Libertarian Manifesto because, uh, you know, not only am I interested in what Konkin has to say, I. I, I don't want I don't I would hate to see his works uh, be swept under the rug because because yeah. I think he made a lot of important contributions. Yeah, I think it's copubco.com. K O P U B C O dot com is where he's putting the archives. And maybe there's a link there to the GoFundMe page. Yeah. All right. Um why don't we go ahead and uh, take a look at some of the uh, questions I managed to uh get on twitter um uh tom tom has a question though i think i can deem it i can like email it or dm it to you uh uh, let's see um because uh he's he's uh asking about a wallpaper that he has on his laptop (laughs) what your thoughts are on it um let's see uh leonardo chapa cast asked uh what what is Hoppe up to in his next book? Well, um, the Mises Institute is uh, right now. Well, there's two things that I'm aware of. Um, his book, The Great Fiction, which um, which was published, uh, Jeff Tucker edited it um, in oh, maybe 2012. It was when Jeff was at Laissez Faire Books. Now that was sort of like a sequel to the Economics and Ethics of Private Property. Which came after the theory of socialism and capitalism. So theory of socialism and capitalism is sort of like an, uh, uh, a comprehensive book written from the ground up, and then some of his articles were collected into Economics and Ethics of Private Property, and then uh, a second batch of those articles were compiled into the Great Fiction. Um, and now the Mises Institute is coming out with uh, with a second expanded edition with some additional material, which is coming out I think just in a couple of months. So that's one, and also he delivered this, I think, like a ten lecture seminar on history and property and society about maybe twelve, fifteen years ago at Mises, and it was recorded, and they transcribed it all and have cleaned it up, and they're that's coming out as a book, uh, I think, later this year as well from Mises. Um, as far as what he's working on himself. I don't know, but let's see. We can go to – so he's having his annual Property and Freedom Society meeting in September of this year in Turkey, which was canceled last year because of the COVID, <clears throat> and he usually presents whatever he's working on there. Um, I know he's been working – thinking a lot about history of man, that kind of thing, and I think some excerpts or some shorter versions have been published. Oh yeah, so his talk this year doesn't. Uh, it's, his talk this year is the idea of a private law society, the case of Karl Ludwig von Haller. So who I've never heard of. So that'll be interesting to hear. So he will present that later this year. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, 
<laughs> Wait, I think this is from it is from you. <laughs> Ask him why he didn't listen to uh <laughs> <laughs> yes. VJ Boyapai about uh Bitcoin in twenty twelve. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, we all can we all kick ourselves for not buying more Bitcoin earlier, right? Uh, I mean, Eric, yeah, July I has, Eric July has been getting jumped on for not talking about it enough. Yeah, I saw that thread. I I thought I must have walked in midway through because I didn't understand the – unless there was a background I missed. I mean some guy just started berating him for not talking about Bitcoin enough on his show, uh, which is an odd criticism. It's like – why? Is that his job to have a Bitcoin show? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's... there's other cryptocurrencies that exist. Yeah, true. Oh, if you were saying that on Clubhouse, you'd be booted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, what, Clubhouse what... is rife with Bitcoin maxis, and they just kick out the 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 shit coiners. They call them as soon as they say something like that. <laughs> I mean, the thing that baffles me about this whole thing is like, you know, if you really if you want Bitcoin talked about enough, then create your own show or something, right? I mean, it's – or do a video about it or or create a Twitter and promote it or something. I mean, I'm, I'm just – it just baffles me that uh, it doesn't it, – it just never came to mind with these people. It, it's almost – I, I've seen this so many times with Eric July, and it's happening with me. It's like people want him to hold a position that he doesn't hold. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, it, it, I, I think that happens to you as well. You know, kind of like, uh, oh, looks like we have to talk about IP. <laughs> and, yep. and it's like, uh, you know, there, I'm sure you've been called a Marxist several times because you oppose IP. Uh, if oh, yeah. I'm not mistaken. A, a, a commie, a commie, usually. Yeah, I'm a commie or a socialist. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I'm a commie or a socialist because I don't think people, um, uh, I don't think that uh, God or its proxy, the state, ought to guarantee an income to people for the work they put into the project. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, it's yeah, it's just you can't. That's essential. That's yeah. essentially the IP view. And I told you Bitcoin would come up, and so now so is IP. It's it's unavoidable. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, you can't own an idea. You you actually cannot. That's correct. Yeah, a lot of times libertarians. That kind of agree with me. They'll say something like intellectual property doesn't exist, and you know I don't. I'm not pedantic and correct them. I don't think that's actually that's not the argument really. The question is like not whether there's intellectual property. Um, the question is whether intellectual property law is justified. That's the question. Um, it, I mean, you know, it's like it's like saying, do you own your wife? The answer is not. Do wives exist? Do you know what I mean? It's right. Yeah. Should you should you own your wife? Mm -hmm. Right. Or it's or um, another way of looking at it is uh, if I go into someone's house and take their television, they don't have their television anymore. But if I but if I like make a copy of uh, a video, they still have the video. Well, that's the thing. People always say this and say, well, it's wrong for you to take my idea and make money off of it. And I'm like, well, they're not taking it. They're copying it. OK, the reason we use the word take and as pejorative connotations is because normally when you take something that means the owner doesn't have it anymore that's why he objects i mean i don't want you to take my cow because i need my cow <laughs> if you take it i don't have it anymore but yeah. if instead you were like a magician and you looked at my cow from across the field and you waved your wand and you made another cow in your land it wouldn't be taking my cow it'd be copying my cow right and then they also say you shouldn't make money off of my work. It's like, well, what does that mean off of? I mean, we all make money off of other people's contributions. That's called the division of labor in society. I mean, we all benefit from cooperation and from each other's uh, contributions. So yeah. it's weird. It's just weird how people keep bringing the same old things up, up over and over again. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, um, you know, I, I figured out my position on like borders, immigration on my own. I didn't have anybody influencing me at all. Not even, not even Hoppe, not Bob Murphy, no one. And right. then once, once I figured it out and then I discovered that they pretty much hold the same position I do. It's like, Oh, it, 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 it's like, it's like, 
it, and it's it's that wasn't stealing that that was i figured it out on my own it's an idea that's kind of being spread around so is that so if uh if Hoppe came up with it, did I steal it from him? No, <laughs> that's no, not how it and, works. And, and and all all ide- all all innovative, you know, creative works, all discoveries, everything's incremental. It has to be incremental. It's yeah. always, you know, this new bit of knowledge added on top of what we knew already. So everything is incremental. Um, and interestingly, Hoppe, you know, in a couple of interviews where Hoppe goes into this, uh, and I've talked to him about it. Um, so he was kind of a lefty but very smart kind of you know academic type influenced by Kant and some of his teachers like Hopper Moss and these guys in in Germany uh but then he started discovering on his own that like the the standard approach to economics is flawed right so he started kind of coming up with on his own without exposure to the Austria school he started coming up with basically what was praxeology all the category, and then he st- then he somehow stumbled across uh, ac- across Mises, and, and he, he read it. He was oh, finally some economics makes sense, and this Mises guy basically has already figured out what I was kind of recreating myself on my own. So he abandoned you know his his own attempt and just became a Misesian. But I often sort of wonder what would have happened if he had never, you know. Or if he'd come across Mises later, like he finished his own approach, it might have been – maybe it had been better or different than Mises. You know, it'd be hop, hopopraxiology or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Here's here's uh, another question. Uh, Tom wanted to bring that uh, wanted to bring this one up, but uh, at least it's here. Anyways, um, uh, Daniel W. said, I would love to hear his thoughts about the kind of NRX Machiavellians red pill <laughs> cathedral stuff that some in the Liberty Movement have been talking about recently. Uh, uh, how do you say his name? Pete Qu- uh, Quinn. It starts with a Q. Oh, P- Peter Quinones. Pete Quinones. There we go. And uh, yeah. And then let's see, uh, Michael Malice, Matt Erickson, and Keith Knight. Is there any good information there? Oh, I mean, this is this is one thing I, you're just not. I'm not going to be. Uh, this one thing I'm not an expert on. I I don't honestly. I I still have trouble understanding the the pill things that the memes that everyone you know the red pill, blue pill. I I mean I saw the Matrix, but it just doesn't resonate with me as a as a rigorous way to understand reality. I just don't find it useful. I guess it's kind of funny, but I, it's sort of like calling the Republicans, Democrats, blue and red. I mean, I, I just think these things are just inaccurate conceptual categories. Um, so I don't follow the neo reactionary stuff, or I don't know. What the, I really don't know what the what, what pill did he say? The red pill? Yeah, the red pill. Oh yeah, the blue and the red. Like one is high uh blinding yourself to the re- reality of being a sheep and the other is opening yourself to the reality that's really there even though it might be uncomfortable i forget which one is which i guess red is the is the is the open-eyed one but and uh, the orange pill i guess is learning about bitcoin because their logo is orange now what michael malice has a new book coming out called the white pill which sounds uh uh interesting uh, it's about the case for optimism basically Oh, EP, Which, you wanted to ask a question. Oh. Uh, yeah, I was wondering what your thoughts were on voluntary syndicalists. I mean, I'm I'm okay with anything that's voluntary, but it seems to me that all these little enclave ideas have to be built upon a private property superstructure, right? So you can do whatever you want within private property rules, but if you do, then you're re- basically respecting – anarcho-capitalism in a sense so uh and if, if you think about it it's sort of like the tolerance issue the one-way two-way issue like you know we libertarians are tolerant of socialists and commies because we would let them form their own enclaves and do whatever they want as long as they respect each other's rights and it's voluntary but they would not do the same like if they had their socialist society i mean i mean the real socialist you know they they would not allow an anarcho-capitalist or a libertarian uh village or enclave where as nozick said you know um capitalist acts among consenting adults were legal 
they, they would at some point have to outlaw private property ownership or claims or contracts. And a lot of these mutualists and these uh, – I think probably the syndicalist types, ultimately the flaw is they want – they don't want to respect certain contracts. So for example, if you believe that um, an owner of a piece of property like, like a factory who is absent, absentee owner they call it, loses his ownership of it um, because he's no longer there possessing it, well they're, they're making like one – of two mistakes and probably both of them. And one is, um, one is the idea that uh, uh, they're conflating possession and ownership. So if you if you lose your rights to it as soon as you're not using it, that means that there is no right to ownership. There's just a right to possession. But that, the whole purpose of property rights is to distinguish ownership from possession. Is to is to say that. Possession is one thing, and ownership is the other. Ownership is the right to possess in a sense. So if I have a car and I loan it to you, I still own the car, but you're using it. You possess it, but you don't have the right to sell it or destroy it, and you have to give it back when I ask you for it. Right? So those are just, just the same concepts, and if you don't have ownership, then all you have is a world might makes right. Um, like whoever has it has it. It's just power, which sort of infects this new – this sort of uh, – Maybe the neo reactionary stuff too, right? The uh, Curtis Jarvin stuff, all these neo monarchist types. They basically reject rights talk and rights language and normative language and kind of believe power is all that there is. Um, and then the other mistake they make is like you say that you can only possess something that you're controlling. Well, but you are controlling it through your agents, through your employees, right? So the contract with them says, I'm going to let you use my property, and I'm going to pay you money if you do a job while you're working there. But you're you're holding this property sort of in my name, like as my as my renter in a way, but you're not owning it. So if you just say the the the, the worker owns it anyway, then you're violating the contract between the owner and the and the, and the worker. So you're not, and the same thing would be true with like owners of apartment complexes or condominiums where. People are renters, and they rent it, and they live there. You know, uh, the reason they don't homestead it is because they're tenants; they're not owners, and they're not even squatters because they're using it with the permission of the owner. It's inter It's kind of. It's kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually planning a special where I have almost all of the. Uh, colors of the rainbow of the different flavors of anarchist thought so <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see how that how that goes i mean i usually see like an ancom or an ancap uh on together but i've never seen an anprim or or a or a transhumanist on together so that's <laughs> and well an un anprim would be understandable because they would be against technology at least technology that comes from the state I mean, they have a point about the fact that uh, the way social media, you know, while well intentioned, you know, it's kind of gone downhill. You know, especially, especially uh, how it has impacted the culture. I mean, I, I which uh, actually comes up with another question, which helps me comes up with another question. Uh, <laughs> so what, what are your thoughts about how social media uh, has taken things? I mean, I, I'm not hysterical about it like a lot of people are. Uh, I mean, I'm still a strict plumb line libertarian, so I don't. I I do think people have the right to do whatever they want with their private property, and I'm not surprised that they've turned kind of leftist. A lot of these tech, these tech liber, these I used to call them tech libertarians, the ones in Silicon Valley, they're just showing that they're kind of soft-headed, muzzy-headed, you know. Uh, kind of lefties in a sense, and I'm not surprised by it. I'm not surprised Hollywood's like that or the, or the press. Um, you know, Some libertarians argue that they don't really own their, their property because they're in bed with the state. I think that's a slippery slope and, and not true. Um, I mean you can't just run around classifying the New York Times or, or, or Facebook as effectively fair game for violence or, or, or unjust laws. Um, just because you don't like their politics, I mean, just because they're socialists doesn't mean they're in bed with the state. 
um, everyone's in bed with the state to a degree. So I just think it's better to try to work to disentangle it and to reduce the state's power rather than to look, run around trying to blame people for being slightly tainted for having some association with the state and then using their taint as an excuse to hurt them. I mean that's not the goal of liberty. Mm -hmm. it, the goal of liberty is not to find excuses to hurt people by, by characterizing them as, as some, kind of, some kind of quasi aggressor, which is effectively what all this is. Even when you hear people saying, oh, we should remove their Section 230 waiver of liability under the Communication Decency Act um, because they're acting like a publisher instead of a neutral platform now. A lot of conservatives are saying this, but even some libertarians. But that's because they don't understand that the, that the CDA Act only pr protects publishers – I'm sorry, uh, platforms – protects them from liability for the death – defamatory acts of their users. But defamation is an unjust law because it should not be illegal to commit defamation. So any statute that protects someone from liability for defamation is good. It's like, you know, it's like right now uh, certain people are exempt from prosecution for drugs, like medical researchers who have some special permission, let's say, right? Well, just because not everyone is immune from prosecution for for the drug war doesn't mean the solution is to make the medical researchers subject to it or like some of these uh, stupid evil democrats say that um they want to reinstate the reinstate the draft because right now it's predominantly you know the, the service the military service is voluntary so called I actually don't think it's completely voluntary because I think people are forced into it by economic circumstances caused by the government. So we actually have a form of conscription now, like economic conscription. But the solution of that is not to draft rich white boys who are who who get out of it now because they don't need to do it for money. You know, that's horrible. That's sort of like these, you know, the people that want integrated schools and they they want to, you know, they want to force integrate people because they want like the privileged uh, smart kids to be in school with you know the, the in public schools with the with the kids that are not as smart or, or or maybe they want the brown kids to have white kids in their class i mean it's sort of condescending to the blacks to say yo they need a good example i mean I, they need the white example there to to learn from or something i mean they want to sacrifice make some kids sacrificial lambs right to for the for the masses who are suffering because the schools suck because the the Democrats have ruined it. Um, I got off on a tangent, but uh, <laughs> where were we? Sorry. Uh, I I I I I was just soaking everything in. I kind of lost. Right. I'm kind of lost too. So sorry. <laughs> so um, I don't know. Uh, anyways. Um, <laughs> Here's probably my most favorite question of all the other questions here. What's it like being such a heavyweight? <laughs> oh, the, the the head is what does it say? The the crown is the crown hangs heavy on the head. <laughs> uh, no, seriously. Uh, I I mean, uh, it's been sort of fun to have climbed to a position where. Uh, my work is known and discussed and respected, and you know I'm just working for liberty like everyone else. And my 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 personal role in it has been to work on libertarian theory, right? Um, other people work on more activism things or practical applications or spreading the message or just supporting causes with their money or with their time. Um, so. I, I, I think I've developed some specialties in a few narrow areas like intellectual property theory and a couple of areas where praxeology and legal I, I, I kind of have a unique set of knowledge in a, on, on a pretty high level like legal theory, partly because I went to a school in Louisiana which has a civil law state. So I learned both the Roman civil law system and the common law, which I, has been helpful to me in my libertarian theory, plus Austrian economics, plus the influence of the radicals like Hoppe and Rothbard. Um, so I try to just bring that to the table when I discuss some some issues. So, um, but there's lots of things. I'm, I mean, people ask me all the time. I mean, I'm an NCAP, 
So people always ask me the, the anarchist questions like a, a competing defense agencies and that kind of stuff, and I have some thoughts, and I've read on it, but I haven't really written much on it. It's just not my area. You know, I defer to like David Friedman and Randy Barnett and Hans Hermann Hoppe and M Molinari and Bob Murphy uh, and the Tannehills, people like that. So I just try to know my place and work on the areas I can make contributions at, which I think has been pretty narrow. But I've always tried to approach things incrementally, like – uh, like I have my book coming out later this year, which is a, a collection of my essays, articles, but they kind of come together like a book because every time I wrote, I tried to build in a consistent way on the last one, and a few times I would I would plan – like I knew there was a chunk missing, but I was going to write on it later, so I, I kind of planned around that, so they sort of fit together. So I've tried to carefully go and only go where I'm pretty sure. So that – and it's resulted in a pretty consistent edifice, I think. Um, not comprehensive, but pretty consistent and somewhat broad. Um, so I mean I'm kind of joking. The heavyweight thing was 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 sort of a, a funny meme that came because like, like right now, I'm giving my time. You guys are giving your time. We're all giving our time in the service of liberty. It's kind of a hobby, but we're doing it um, out of a good motive, right? And – I actually happen to have a lot of deep knowledge I've worked on for 25, 35 years in a few areas. And you know, a lot of the people that write these books and these things, they're not accessible. You know, like Hoppe's disappeared, uh, you know, or he's just old old school. He's not on the internet. But when I go into these topics and someone is new and they start asking questions, that's fine. But and I'm I'm always willing to politely answer questions and, and have patience. But when you get belligerent and you don't even like you know, it's like you're just wasting your time and mine and people listening. If you just hit me with stupid arguments that I already debunked, and, and the funny thing is, like, so someone will ask a question, and this is usually Twitter or Facebook, so there's not a lot of space to write like a treatise, you know. And plus, the attention span of the modern generation is pretty low. So I'll give two or three links to a couple of blog posts like that have the answers. And then they'll get mad. They say, "Oh, you're barraging me with links." It's like Jesus Christ, what do you want, man? <laughs> uh, so I just think people should – when someone's willing to g give you their knowledge and they've, they're a specialist, you, you, you know, take advantage of it. You know, like when I talked to George Selgin about free banking, I don't agree with all of it, but I ask questions, and I know he studied it a lot more than me. Um, so that, that's where that came up with us. I I, someone asked a question like, well, what do you think? I said, what I think is you realize you're talking to a heavyweight. Take advantage of it. Don't be a punk. And I kind of was joking, but it became a meme. Yeah, I think you uh, kind of gave some good advice to Jan Hellfeld <laughs> in some ways. Now, Hellfeld was so, so everyone thinks I'm rude and I'm 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 arrogant and condescending, but usually I'm not because like this, you know, if someone has a question and I I'm talk patiently to people that have different views all the time, and I don't mind if people disagree. Uh, but Hellfeld started out. Like I never pretend like uh, something is what it's not. So Hellfell was started attacking me for 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 say in, for not following the, the 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 stupid rules of the debate, which he claims we had agreed to an email, which is like he asked me twelve questions and I asked him twelve. I mean, imagine a, a, a debate like that. So I just said, "This is stupid. I'm not going to do it." He's like, "This is a problem you enter because you never followed the rules." And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, okay, so you're you're criticizing me for not following the rules in an impromptu, unpaid, informal debate, um, but you are sitting there advocating that I be taxed. So let's keep things in perspective. You know, don't get on a high horse with me. And he he said I'm insulting him. I'm like, okay, let's say I'm insulting you. Let's say I'm not following the rules of the debate. Those are pretty minor offenses compared to you endorsing and condoning and advocating you know, the institutionalized power of the police to come into my home and threaten to arrest me and put me in federal fucking prison if I don't pay taxes to support your, your little state. So you know, don't criticize me for something trivial when you're advocating for criminality. And I, you know, I will I will I will give you the benefit, not the benefit of the doubt, but I will Treat you as a civilized member deserving of respect and have a debate with you, even though there's a lurking threat of threat behind a threat of force behind what you're doing, right? So, like, you barely deserve to be 
polite treated with politeness and respect in civilized company because you're basically advocating for criminality. So I'm willing to do that, but don't push it, buddy. That kind of that's my attitude on that. <laughs> oh man, I I I just I just couldn't get over that all his arguments were basically suppose you were in the desert and you were dying of thirst and you needed to steal some water, would you do it? You know, it's like it's like asking it's, just, it's not an argument. Yeah, it's like asking the question, you know, uh, you were tied down in your in your seat or or in your chair, and then uh, you had a gun to your head. Would you take the bullet if uh, and this this the bad guys wanted to blow up the world? Would you take the bullet or w would you let the world blow up? What would you do? You know, it's like it's like uh, it's like if you were the mother in Sophie's choice, which of the babies would you give up to the Nazis? <laughs> like what the heck? <laughs> it's like uh. <laughs> I don't know. Why don't we pause the fucking interview and let's go watch it and let's make a decision. Uh, that'd be real interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, just, I don't know. It was just it was just hysterical. But I honestly, I think, but I I think I would have to agree. Your de your debate with Robert Wenzel was far more hysterical. Because <laughs> he's like, Stefan, Stefan, why'd you call me a clown? <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you seem like a clown to me. What, what do you mean to say? <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. I mean, I, first, I, that, guy, that guy is, look, I, I, there's some stories I could tell about him. I, I, I'm not going to tell it in public, but I, when I, met, I met him in person before that at, in the lounge of the, at the, of the bar at the Auburn Hotel. Uh, and I was sitting there well, – I'll tell part of it. I was sitting there on my iPad, I think, some Apple device. He walked up, and he started making fun of me for using an Apple device because I don't believe in intellectual property. So I guess you know I'm a hypocrite for using Apple products or something. So I just smiled, and I offered to buy him a drink, and I bought him a drink, and we, I was polite to him. And, we were and then he started telling me these stories about his youth, which are mind-blowing. Either they're true… Or they're completely fabricated, which either one is, is 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 not a good sign. But if they were true, they were crazy, and if they were false, it's, he's he's got a weird imagination and a weird way of of, of talking to strangers. So anyway, he's an odd dude, very odd dude, and, and I don't think his name is Raymond uh, uh, Robert Wenzel. There, someone has done research. I mean, he's got like about a dozen pseudonyms he's gone by. So he's he's got some weird shady past. He's a weird dude. Didn't he like say he went to the Federal Reserve or something and like recorded yeah. a conversation? My speech, my, spe my speech at the Federal Reserve. He delivered a speech at the Federal Reserve, and then it turned out he sat in the lunchroom with a couple of buddies and read his paper to him while having lunch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's odd. <laughs> and and his so his argument so he, this all happened because he. You know, he was cozying up to to the Mises Institute, and uh, he got annoyed by Jeff Tucker and my. At the time, we were both closely associated. We were pushing the anti-IP line, and he got annoyed by that. Um, so he got more and more rude. That's why I called him a clown because he got more and more rude. And then we decided to have a debate. And then, you know, his his argument was, I know a formula that I can use to get. Uh, links from the Drudge Report. And he goes, "Tell me the formula, Stefan. Tell me the formula." I'm like, I don't know the formula. <laughs> Aha! There's IP because I have the formula and it's valuable, and you don't know what it is. That proves there's intellectual property. <laughs> I mean, wow! Never thought of that amazing, genius, sophisticated argument, Bob. <laughs> Uh, I, and that's – I think that's one of the biggest problems when arguing for IP. Just because it says property doesn't mean it's legitimate. Correct. So that's 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 the issue. I mean the if it's – and not only that, if it's a state creation, then that should be a red flag. Yeah, I mean slaves were property too, so so what? Yeah. <laughs> so – so does that does that I mean yeah I mean, these these people these people don't have a they don't think in conceptual and principal terms they're not consistent they they can't even distinguish what sense they mean words in I mean you know uh, they can't distinguish prescription from description right from wrong what is the law and what the law should be right what's yeah. aspirational 
what, what's descriptive, uh, you know, what's is and what's ought. I mean, you can't you can't just say. And then they also make, you know, they make the same mistakes a lot of the Bitcoiners, like a lot of the anti-Bitcoiners, like Peter Schiff. They keep making this argument that you know, well, Bitcoin, unlike gold, doesn't have intrinsic value. You know, as as if gold hasn't nothing has intrinsic value. Number one, right? Yeah. And gold did and does have a non-monetary value, but they they sort of like act like well, gold is back. So gold is backed by its intrinsic value, its non-monetary value. Well, it's not backed by it because once gold – gold has a value on the market before it's money, right? like for jewelry, and then it, when it starts becoming used as money because it's, it's suited to be money, it, it, it becomes even more valuable because now it's the thing that's used in the monetary network. So it, it acquires a value on top of its mon non-monetary value. So that value is what people rely on when they save in, in gold. So if it stopped being used as money, right. it would collapse down to the non-monetary value. So it's not backed. You know, maybe one tenth of the value is is backed. So mm -hmm. you're still not protected. Nothing, no money can ever be backed by anything. Right. Anyway. It's so I think they're making the same mistake, right? This intrinsic value mistake. And so the IP guys say that if something has value, that means it's property. See, they're conflating property and things that have value. And they also make a similar mistake. If you can sell something, it means you own it, right? But that's because they're not thinking carefully about these concepts, sale. And they're not distinguishing economic behavior, which is descriptive. From from law, which is prescriptive, right? Which is right. normative. So, selling something in an economic sense is just a way that we explain people's motives in the means in the praxeological framework. Like the reason I gave you the apple was to get the orange. So, you can call it a sale because that's just a compressed way of explaining. … the characteristics of that action. Like I employed my apple to get an orange. The means used was the – my apple. The end was the obtaining of an orange. But I might want something other than an orange, so I might want uh, a girl to kiss me. So I give her an apple. She kisses me. In the means end action framework, it's still praxeologically the case that I use the apple… To get something I wanted, the end that I wanted, which was for her to act in a certain way to give me a kiss. And you could say she sold me the kiss because it's analogous to the other one, and you could describe it that way, but that's just a way of describing the motivations for what she did. She mm -hmm. kissed me in order to get an apple. She used the means of her own body and her control over it to perform an action that satisfied me, gave me, made me induced to give her an apple, right? But that doesn't mean she owns her kiss. I mean that's just an, a metaphorical sloppiness there. It's, it's, it's what we call reification when you take a concept that's abstract and describes something usefully, and you turn it into an existing sort of thing, right? Like yeah. my love for my child knows no bounds. Well, how much does it fucking weigh? <laughs> you know? I mean, or, or they'll say, well, do rights exist? I mean that kind of language starts pushing people into confusion about – Sort of the metaphysical status of these things, or the ontological status, whichever one you want to you want to say. Um, so, value is just a concept we use to explain why people do things. So we say that when someone employs a means that they have in their possession, their command, their control, to causally interfere with the world according to the laws of cause and effect, to to change the course of things that would happen to achieve an end result in the future that's different than what would have otherwise happened. That's their purpose or the end or the goal of their action, and they employed means to achieve it. So we, we just say that that demonstrates that they valued that end that they pursued and that they valued it more than other ends they could have pursued instead. Right? That's where opportunity cost comes into it. So value just is a way of describing the interplay of… Choice and 
and use of means to achieve ends. It just describes – it's a way of tautol almost tautologically saying that you chose that end. You chose the end that you preferred. You demonstrate that you prefer it because you chose it. You acted to achieve it. Right? Doesn't mean value is a, a substance or a thing that's inside of something. So just because something has value on the market, which and all that means is someone is willing to give you money to get you to give it to them. That's what has value means. Has value means other people desire that thing. The fact that someone subjectively in, in their intentions in their mind desires an object. Does not mean – or I should say more broadly, they desire an end result. doesn't mean that that end result is property. Like the end result might be I want to see the sunset, so I get in my car and I drive to the beach in time to see it. That's the end result I wanted. That's the goal of my action. I value seeing the sunset. doesn't mean it's something I, – I might even pay money to do it. So I purchase the sunset. I own the sunset. The sunset's an ownable thing. See, all these people don't think carefully like this because they're not steeped in praxeology. If you are, then you start I mean you start seeing things right away. All right. Um uh EP, do you, did you have any other questions? If you're still there. Uh yeah, I'm still here. Uh basically uh I don't really agree with the like terms and stuff, but like uh, it's semantics at this point. I, I don't care. <laughs> I, I guess you could define things however you want as long as you can understand each other. That's correct. I agree with that, um, but you got to be careful then, especially if you use terms in an idiosyncratic way. Um, and you also have to be careful that people aren't doing it on purpose to be disingenuous or to equivocate. Uh, which they do sometimes. Sometimes they do it sloppily and innocently and just out of ignorance or carelessness, but sometimes they do it on purpose. Like, so status often will say something like uh, – they'll try to argue against anarchy by saying um, that they equivocate on the word government. So they'll use it in one sense to mean the governing institutions of society, which we anarchists believe in, like not – Unless you're a chaos anarchist who wants the world to collapse, you know most of his anarchists think that you would have hierarchy and rules and order and law in a private society. Now, the the the, the status the anarchists don't believe that they think there would not be law in a free society, but we do. So that's a difference of opinion. But we we don't favor lawlessness. So we we favor what we would call what you could call governance, like the govern. So whatever institutions would provide law and order and and hierarchy and rules. We just don't think it would be state. And so they'll get you to admit that you want law and order, and you say yes. So they'll say, okay, so you believe in government. I'll say yes. And they'll say, well, then you can't be an anarchist. And I'll say, well, no, anarchist means you're against the state. right? So they switch to the second word of government, the second meaning of the word government, which means can mean can mean state. So it depends on how you define government. If you say, do you believe in government? Well, if you mean by that the governing institutions of society, yes. If you mean by that the state, then no. So you tell me how you mean it, and just be careful with it. But they don't want to be careful with it right? because they think they mean the same thing. They think that you have to have a state to have order, and so to them, the two senses of the word government converge on each other. But they're using a confused form of semantics to make their case, which is just – is invalid and usually dishonest, I believe. But that's just one example. Mm -hmm. um, Another one's the word scarcity, by the way, which uh, you know they'll say something. You know, so like when we say property rights adhere to scarce resources in Mises' sense, what that means is rivalrous resources because that's what that's just what they are. That's an economic concept. So we mean scarcity in the technical economic sense of rivalrousness. Uh, but it, there's another sense which means just lack of abundance, right? Not not very abundant. And so you point out that property rights adhere to scarce resources, and someone will say, well, you can have property rights and ideas because good ideas are scarce. I mean you see how they do that equivocation there. They, they slip from one meaning of the sense of the word to the other, and mm -hmm. so this is one way is I try not to use the word scarce anymore, or I try to define it every freaking time, or I say rivalrous. In fact, I've come up with my own concept. My word, which I don't use that much yet, but I might like in future writing, 
I call resources that have property rights in them conflictable. Like, so that's the essential characteristic. And rivalrous kind of means that too. So you think of rivals or people that can have conflict with each other, people that are rivals over something. But it's it's the property of something that there can be conflict over it, which gives rise to rise to the need to have property rights, right? To settle the dispute about the thing. So it's really things that are conflictable, uh, or things that are subject to property rights, in my view. Um, I, uh, one last thing uh, before we uh, before we end this. Um, I remember in the last show, you know, we talked about how it, it just because you're an IP lawyer and you're against IP does not mean that you're being a hypocrite because you know you're you're basically there to uh, put an end to all of this. Uh, um, wouldn't you say that? Uh, a primitivist who wants to use the internet even though they don't like technology do you think they're hypocritical for trying to for having to work around and stuff to promote their ideas uh that's that's interesting um i don't think the situations are analogous but um but the question of whether i'm not so sure about that i don't know if a primitivist is necessarily hypocritical for using technology because it depends on what it means to be a primitivist. If being a primitivist means you should not use technology, then yeah, he's being a hypocrite. But it's sort, of, it's sort of like the libertarian thing. To be a libertarian doesn't necessarily mean that you think people should not commit aggression. It really means you think that the only laws that are justified are those that are directed against aggression. Right, so it's not a personal moral code necessarily. Rothbard sort of pointed this out. Um, so just like there can be cases where you doing something that's within your rights is immoral, you know, like being rude to your child or something or your grandmother for no reason, that's immoral but doesn't violate anyone's rights. Well, your child it might violate his rights because you have a positive obligation to be a good dad. But let's say your grandmother. Um, <clears throat> Or a stranger, um, and likewise, it could be argued that there are some cases where it would be immoral to respect rights, or it would not be immoral to violate rights. You know, because maybe you should violate rights in some cases to save your, you know, your kid's life or something. Uh, but then you have to be willing to to pay the price of violating the right because the legal system is justified in holding you to account for that. So it's just a personal decision about – now, I think by and large there's a convergence between morals and between rights, but one is, can be seen as a meta-norm and one is a personal norm. Um, so uh, by the same token, if you are a primitivist, maybe your goal is to move to a society where we have more primitivity. So uh, in that case, I don't think it's necessarily hypocritical. Um, it's just like it's not hypocritical of us to use government roads even though we oppose the roads because when we say we oppose the roads, it doesn't mean we think no one should use government roads. What we mean is there should not be government roads, and government roads should be privatized. So using the government road is not inconsistent with claiming these roads should be privatized. Um, make, make sense? Yeah, I mean… I mean, with the roads thing, I mean, you know, if people are like, well, then why are you using the roads? I mean, another way of looking at it is uh, it's like, well, my taxpayer dollars are going to it, so I might as well make good use out of my money that's being taken from me by force. Yeah, but even – I, I see, even that, I would – I think that's a little bit uh, – it's a little bit like conceding too much to make that excuse. Like it's it's – by making that defense, you're acting like your behavior needs defending, and I think it really doesn't need defending. Um, I mean if you have a prisoner, someone in jail in federal prison right now for, for, a, for a drug offense who is a libertarian, right, and, uh, and they don't – like let's say Ross Ulbricht or someone, so, someone's in prison right now, and they think the prison shouldn't exist. Are they hypocritical for being in prison? I mean they can't do <laughs> choice. I guess they sh – should they commit suicide? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just if if someone is forced by circumstances that they disagree with to comply with them, they're not the hypocrite; they're the victim. 
Right, right, right. All right. Uh, that's uh, pretty much uh, everything uh, for this show. So, uh, Stefan, uh, once again, as always, uh, thanks for coming on. It's uh, always fun having you on. Glad to do it. Thank you, guys. Yeah. It's so, uh, um, oh, yeah. And one last thing. Uh, you know, you want to let everyone know where uh, they can find any of your works or your writings or – well, I'm Ines Kinsella is my sort of my at my at my social media handle on Twitter and Facebook, and um, my main website is stephankinsella.com. Not to be confused with Stephen with an E, because that goes to uh, an artist I just found out about stephankinsella.com, stephenkinsella.com. Um, so s t e p h a n kinsella.com. I know a lot of people. A lot of people refer to you as Stefan or Stephen or <laughs> yeah, you know, it's all the time. All the time. Or my first name, Norman. Yep. Mm. It's okay. So, all right. Well, uh, th uh, thanks again for coming on. And I want to thank you all for tuning in. And please come back soon. <laughs>